All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's presentation is gonna be a, a market update on uh, mergers and acquisitions, activity, trends, other factors influencing uh, the business. Um, I'm Craig Rausch, I'm a senior counsel in Foley and Lardner's Milwaukee office in the transactions practice group. I'm joined here today with John Witt, who's a partner in the transactions group. He's based in Foley's Detroit office. And together our practice focuses on mergers, acquisitions, public company securities work, uh, primarily in the middle market, which for purposes of this trend, uh, presentation, we're calling 25 to 250 million. Uh, but of course, transactions as small as just a few million dollars and as large as a billion dollars or more. Uh, today's presentation will cover our experiences and industry trends that we've seen largely through the third quarter of 2023 uh, with a bit of a look ahead at what we can expect for 2024. Um, as I said, primarily focused on the middle market, uh, 25 to 250 million plus or minus. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, uh, you should have a Q&A function uh, in the presentation interface. You can put your questions in there and then we'll turn to those at the end of the presentation. Uh, but with that, I think I'll turn it over to John to kind of start us off with a look at the current state of the market. Thanks, Greg. So I would say the biggest takeaway, I guess if you take one takeaway when, during your next cocktail hour is that, and I'm sure many of the folks have been feeling it, um, deal volume is down probably about 10% year to date if you compare 23 against uh, 22. Um, but I guess taking a step back, you know, M&A activity deal volume, you know, really peaked in 21. Um, and then volume began to ebb as we moved into 2022. And really 23 has continued this downward trend off of the peak um, that we experienced in 21. Um, but I think it's important to note that uh, where we're at right now is still above or at least uh, very comparable to the pre-pandemic 2019 levels, um, which itself was a very good year. So despite you know, the relative recent slowdown that we've been experiencing from really the record 21 time period, um, we continue to experience a very robust middle market um, you know, in the M&A space. And I know anecdotally, um, you know, we're seeing those firms and those banks and those um, you know, other outfits that specialize um, in the M&A middle market to continue to be very busy, you know, especially those shops that focused on remaining lean uh, really during the boom times uh, of 21, you know, who didn't overhire to meet demand. Um, you know, in terms of pricing, um, similar to deal volume, you know, it's off of the peaks um, that we saw in 21. Uh, with the exception of certain industry specific variances, and of course, you know, every unique target company, you know, we're seeing adjusted EBITDA multiples um, down to around eight to 8.5 times uh, with uh, larger declines in multiples uh, with deals that are sub 100 million. Um, you know, in the healthcare business and services space, we're actually seeing some higher multiples um, than these averages, really in the range of nine times. Uh, and then, of course, in the manufacturing space, which has been slightly less desirable, um, we're seeing lower multiples really in the range of seven times. So, you know, of course, uh, the inevitable question is, well, why, why the declines, right, from 21 to now where we sit um, and the, you know, as we move into Q4 of 23. Um, well, in part, this is the result of the challenging financing environment that everyone's been experiencing. Um, so notably, higher interest rates have made debt financing in the credit markets considerably less attractive to buyers. Um, this obviously has reduced the potential pool of buyers or bidders. Um, this has reduced financing options. And then in turn, you know, that less competition has resulted in lower deal pricing. Uh, in response, uh, you know, private credit has stepped in to ease some of the pressure, uh, but it has not been able to do so completely, hasn't been able to fill this vacuum, um, in part because of the elevated rates. Um, you know, private equity firms uh, have begun showing a preference for smaller transactions with less um, or even no debt financing. And I know the most recent PE deal I did uh, we went ahead and did 100% um, equity backed deal, um, of which, you know, the parties intend in the future uh, to hopefully refi. But in order to get the deal done, uh, they just went ahead and 100% equity backed deal. 
So as a result of these challenges, uh, I know sellers can be feeling disillusioned um, by the lack of interests and bids, um, and of course the valuations that they're, that they're seeing um, at these reduced pricing levels. Um, but you know, parties continue to want to do deals and they're showing resilience to find workarounds in order to get deals done and really to you know, address the misalignment and valuation. Uh, so again, you know, we're seeing buyers uh, and sellers more often utilizing um, seller financing, uh, rollovers, and really recently we've been seeing more and more earnouts. Uh, I think according to the latest deal studies, median earnout potential res- uh, represented 31% of closing payments in non-life science deals in 22, and we've seen that trend continue into 23. You know, and of course, our uh, litigator friends will love seeing these trends. Uh, I always like to remind my clients that, as the Delaware Chancery Court once famously wrote, earnouts all too often transform current disagreements over price into future litigation over outcome. So our litigator friends can uh, thank us later. Um, all that being said, uh, clearer, I would say, but albeit partially cloudy skies uh, appear on the horizon. Um, Craig will now speak on the outlook uh, heading into uh, 2024. I think that's right, uh, John. I think, you know, we're seeing all of those factors kind of align to create a transaction backlog that's building um, and, you know, looks likely to potentially start paying off as we head into 2024. I think we really expect that M&A will be resilient uh, heading into next year. And this is for a couple of reasons, you know, all stemming from the factors that John just laid out. The first is that uh, there's a number of estimates that place the amount of dry powder or sort of cash and reserve uh, that various parties have available to deploy for M&A activity at an unprecedented uh, estimated $1.1 trillion. There's some sources that put this even higher, uh, potentially over 2 million as high as, or uh, over 2 trillion, uh, potentially as high as two and a half trillion dollars. So somewhere in that one to $2 trillion range seems to be the consensus on the available cash that's just looking for to be deployed for deals as we head into 2024. And this is, if you think about it, uh, due to a couple of factors. First is that private equity portfolio companies still need some sort of exit. Private equity firms, investors are gonna demand a return on their investment sort of regardless of the market conditions. And so even if those exits are perhaps less than optimal, there will still be firms looking to make those exits uh, to satisfy their investors. Second is that we continue to see family-owned companies also looking for exits uh, as younger generations seem less interested in continuing to operate the family businesses. I'm sure that those who've dealt with family-owned companies, uh, which includes ourselves uh, through sort of anecdotal experience in the transactions we've done, I can also speak to this personally. Before I was an attorney, I spent about 10 years working in the manufacturing industry for a family-owned company, and I can tell for certain that companies struggle to make that transition, certainly from the first generation founders to the second generation owners and beyond that to the third generation of company leadership. Uh, And so as we move down through the generations, it seems that with each passing generation, uh, there continues to be less interest in in running the family business, especially when those owners are presented with the opportunity to exit for perhaps, you know, 100, 200, 300 million dollars or more um, that sort of exit can look very tempting to somebody who has no interest in running the business uh, long term. And so as we see those exits, that continues to be another strong source of M&A activity as we head into 2024. Uh, Finally, you know, still not to be overlooked are strategic owners who, you know, may have longer ownership horizons and can afford to be slightly more selective in their exits. Um, But we're seeing the pressure there coming from a different direction, which is that as we'll talk about later in this uh, presentation, rising interest rates, you know, make borrowing and financing seem perhaps slightly less attractive. And so as those owners look to find more cash, uh, we see them potentially turning to M&A activity as they, you know, divest business units, lines of businesses, perhaps entire subsidiaries um, to generate cash that, you know, comes at perhaps a lesser price than what they might be able to get uh, through borrowings and financing. And so for all of those reasons, you know, we still continue to see small and middle market M&A being resilient in the, into next year, sort of less affected by some of the macroeconomic trends that, that John is going to talk about next. Um, you know, 
while there are certainly ups and downs in the small and middle market m and I think we find them to be sort of less extreme uh, than perhaps the really big, uh, big market deals, um, which can rise and fall sort of much more dramatically than that small and middle market m and um, This is certainly not to say that, you know, there isn't going to be somewhat of an imbalance in the short term. We think this will be kind of a buyer's market uh, uh, heading into next year. Um, but that, of course, presents its advantages for, for buyers, especially those who have strong balance sheets, uh, free cash, and perhaps a, a longer investment horizon. Those who can afford to be selective in their acquisitions uh, will certainly dominate, we think, this next phase of the coming market. But you know, where we go from here uh, depends uh, not insignificantly on some of the macroeconomic trends. Um, and I'll turn it over to John to talk about uh, some of those points uh, next. Thanks, Craig. Yeah, so, I mean, I guess looking at the economy more broadly, uh, the fundamentals of the economy and the long-term confidence in the stock market it remains solid um, despite the challenges that we've been discussing. Um, inflation has begun to cool, uh, even though I personally don't see that's the case. Um, we are now in the 3% range annualized um, for the last several months, uh, which is down from 6% plus earlier this year and then an average of 8% of inflation last year. So we are experiencing a very positive downward trend in inflation rates. Um, but there is still work to be done to get to the Fed's stated 2% target. Now, admittedly, uh, this is getting outside of my area of expertise. I'm not a trained economist as much as I like to think I am. Um, but the folks in the know uh, would contend that there will likely be one more uh, 25 basis point rate increase this year, um, with the most recent data suggesting that the Fed will likely hold uh, steady in November um, and then bump in December. Um, so all that being said, you know, this has kept hope alive for a soft landing in terms of the economic recovery in general. Um, chances for a recession in 2024 have come down considerably. Um, I would say if you would have asked me or asked folks in general 12 months ago, people would have said 50-50 chance of a recession. Now I think that's shifted to closer to one in three would say that there's going to be a recession. I think economic growth and job growth have remained steady um, with inflation that has been cooling, um, you know, has brightened um, potential economic expectations. Um, third quarter economic growth at 4.9% was higher than expected. Um, you know, there's pent up consumer demand uh, and new housing construction um, is also helping stave off a potential recession. But, you know, the possibility of a recession still exists, you know, especially in areas where the pandemic related growth bubble was the most pronounced. Um, U.S. economic growth also is still expected to slow into the mid 1% range into 2024, though that is up slightly from low 1% earlier in the year. Um, in terms of unemployment, we're also looking at a slight uptick to low 4% from current levels in the high 3% range. So with all of these you know, economic factors, the big takeaway I would say leaves first quarter 2024 M&A activity and pricing, it's still highly uncertain, but the more pessimistic predictions for 2024 appear to be softening and folks you know, are beginning to brighten their expectations on what 2024 may ultimately hold. Of course, a lot of this depends on, you know, how the credit markets shake out, uh, and Craig's going to talk about that now. Thanks, John. So the, yeah, we're continuing to see sort of ongoing challenges, uh, certainly higher prices in the credit markets, of course, being driven by uh, the higher federal funds rate, uh, as John said, you know, there's the potential for that to sort of top out here in the next, you know, month or two or three. Um, and then from 2024, you know, I think uh, most expect it might be some time before that comes down, but certainly uh, to top out here in the near term. And so that could ease some of the pressure on the credit markets uh, in the same period. Um, I think sort of, you know, what we're seeing in the markets right now is um, sort of a, a decrease uh, you know, those high prices are driving a decrease in the amount of uh, debt financing that's being used to consummate M&A transactions. I think we're seeing senior debt at kind of uh, two and a half to three X 
uh, trailing 12 month adjusted EBITDA, which is down about 0.5 or 1x uh, from from about a year prior. Um, and for for junior or sub debt, I think we're seeing uh, half, you know, 0.x, 0.5x to 1x uh, trailing 12 month adjusted EBITDA, which is down uh, from about 1.5 to 2.5x. So if the overall uh, adjusted EBITDA multiples that we're seeing, uh, as John indicated earlier, are kind of right around 8x. Then what you're looking at is, you know, roughly 25 to let's say 40% uh, senior debt, and another, you know, 10 to 15% uh, junior sub debt uh, to sort of make up that that debt burden to get to about 50-50 debt to equity financing. Uh, we're seeing rates that are up about two to 300 basis points over the same period. Uh, so we're looking at above 8% uh, for senior debt as compared to, you know, somewhere in the sixes in 2020, 2022. Um, and then kind of in the mid to high teens for the sub debt uh, as compared to, you know, around 14% uh, in 2022. Um, and so in addition to, you know, the, the rising federal funds rate, uh, we're seeing this being driven in part by some of the bank failures that we experienced in early 2023. We had Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, uh, Credit Suisse uh, in March 2023, First Republic in May 2023. Those uh, that sort of stretch of bank failures have led to a lower risk tolerance uh, that we're seeing from lenders, which means in turn that they're sort of um, you know placing increased importance on their own diligence and scrutiny of the transactions. We're seeing that baked into the lending agreements with sort of tougher agreements on borrowers. Um, and so in some cases, uh, that is leading to, as you know, as John mentioned earlier, uh, buyers having to increase their equity stake uh, to complete certain transactions. Even as John mentioned, um, you know, transactions we're seeing now that occasionally may be entirely equity. Um, I think in the, in the big picture, you know, sort of overall, we're still seeing generally a close to 50-50 debt to equity uh, financing of deal prices, which has you know, in the long run, been sort of the historical norm, uh, plus or minus. Um, but I think where we're seeing that is that, you know, private credit is sort of stepping in uh, to take the place of more traditional financing. Um, and the trade-off there is that the, we're seeing the private credit typically coming with higher prices uh, that then force buyers into the decision of either uh, whether to offer lower prices to sellers, um, which can sometimes lead to friction with sellers uh, maybe disillus disillusionment by some sellers that maybe the M&A market isn't what it was, uh, or uh, in the alternative, buyers accepting sort of more risk directly uh, by taking a bigger equity stake um, in their transactions. Um, and so that's kind of the, you know, sort of the overall uh, trade-off that's playing out as a result of those, um, those trends in the credit markets. Um, but now I'll turn it back to John to talk a little bit more about uh, some of the other uh, trends that we're seeing affecting the M&A space at this point. Thanks, Craig. So, yeah, I mean, certainly the middle market M&A space doesn't exist in a volume. And so, you know, the larger M&A market, both, you know, capital markets, uh, other forms of uh, public private transactions, equity raising, you know, all does impact middle market M&A. And so I'm just going to run through a few of the let's say seven of them that are the top, you know, potentially affect M and A as we head into 2024. And so, um, first off, maybe a quick touch base on where the current IPO market stands. Um, the IPO market is coming back cautiously. I would say uh, IPO activity through Q3 of 2023 was approximately 100 IPOs, uh, which has actually already surpassed um, the full year 2022 totals, which was only around 90. Uh, which included 80 through Q3 of 2022. But, you know, similar to what we're experiencing generally in the middle market M&A space, um, you know, IPOs are still down from the peak um, of 20 and 21, in particular in 21 when there were over 400 IPOs. Um, you know, so again, similar to what we're experiencing in the middle market space, um, you know, the shift away from IPOs has been a result of poor performance of recent IPOs combined with uncertain uh, macroeconomic environment, um, which again, which we've discussed at length at this point. You know, a few years ago, uh, I think investors were willing to take a chance on companies with uncertain prospects. Um, 
you know, now they're demanding a clear path to growth uh, and profitability. Um, but I guess if, uh, again, if you were to ask people who track the IPO markets very closely, you know, with potentially changing economic conditions, uh, I think folks are cautiously optimistic about renewed IPO activity as we head into 2024, really the second half of 24 and then into 25. Second item I think is worth discussing is uh, where inbound uh, cross-border M&A stands. Um, foreign buyer activity continues to be uh, relatively muted uh, and depressed. I would say it's down approximately 15 to 20%. If you were to look year over year, um, 23 versus 22. Uh, I would say through the first half of 2022, there were approximately 4,600 inbound deals as compared to in the first half of 23, um, there were around 3,500 inbound deals. So foreign you know, buyer activity has been uh, a little bit more depressed. Um, the majority of the inbound volume um, has been from Europe, Middle East, and Africa, um, with the remaining half uh, split evenly between Asia Pacific and then the non-US Americas, um, with the top inbound countries being the UK, Canada, Japan, Switzerland, Australia, and then uh, Saudi Arabia. These inbound deals have primarily focused in the healthcare, tech, and professional services space, um, with manufacturing and distribution generally not being a priority as much for these inbound deals. Same story, uh, it's the same macroeconomic factors um, to blame for this depressed um, foreign buyer activity. You know, higher interest rates, geopolitical uncertainty, and then fears of a potential recession. Though, uh, you know, same story, um, you know, all may be easing soon. And I know anecdotally, um, I'm actually seeing quite a bit of interest from my foreign-based clients evaluating U.S. targets. Um, so I'm particularly bullish in this regard, and um, I'm encouraged by the interest that uh, I'm seeing from my foreign-based clients currently. Uh, third, you know, I would say everyone's favorite topic from a couple of years ago. I'm sure everyone touched one of these. Uh, it's the SPAC, DSPAC space. DSPAC continue to be very slow. Um, on the SPAC side, on the SPAC IPO side, we're at a seven-year low given some, you know, relatively recent poor performance of SPACs. Um, and I would say there's going to be few new SPACs likely to enter the pipeline um, as investors are really focusing on unwinding existing SPACs through DSPAC mergers. And I'm sure you've read in the news, and there was recently an article in the Wall Street Journal, post DSPAC merger performance for many former SPACs um, have suffered considerably, um, which has put a significant dent in the hype um, from you know, the, the boom that we experienced in 2021 uh, in the SPAC space. And I know uh, I've heard uh, that there's going to be future uh, potential future SEC rulemaking, which could potentially further hamper um, the SPAC market. Uh, fourth, um, you know, in terms of current public companies that are seeking to potentially go private, um, we are now seeing an increased number of public companies considering going private. You know, of the hundreds of companies that went public in the boom years of 20 and 21, I mean, there have been over 10 already that have agreed to sell themselves to private equity firms. Um, you know, driving the decision um, to opt for a buyout versus remaining public. Um, you know, has largely contributed just to the dismal performance that they've seen since they've become a public company in the last couple of years. Um, you know, many of which are trading way below their debut prices um, after their initial public offering. Um, so that makes companies uh, prime targets for private equity investors um, eager to put, you know, their piles of cash to work. Uh, and it creates exit opportunities for buyout firms with residual stakes that are under pressure to uh, return capital to their fund backers. Um, fifth, I would say it's uh, just really across all of the markets, but it's the impact of quality of earnings analysis uh, on M&A deals. Um, you know, given the tightening of credit markets uh, and buyers, you know, commanding the market, quality of earnings uh, have become standard for almost all transactions, including both on the buy side and the sell side. Uh, I mean, I would say three, four, five years ago, you know, buyers traditionally reserved Q of E only for larger middle market uh, transactions. Um, but what we've been experiencing recently is that buyers want to be sure, uh, and they are hiring outside financial advisors to at least perform the analysis, if not prepare a full report 
for almost all transactions. Um, sellers, and I know Craig can speak to this, especially those closely held family owned companies, um, you know, that may not have had the most rigorous bookkeeping prior to a transaction. They are now equally turning in response um, to sell side QV advisors as a form of self examination, just as a good way um, to find and address issues before a buyer inevitably raises them when they go through the extensive QOV process on the buy side. This is obviously adding time and cost to deals um, as in issues are you know, inevitably identified, you know, which must be addressed you know, either through uh, revisions to the purchase price um, or potentially even structure of the transaction. Um, sixth, I would say it's the role um, that the FTC and DOJ have been playing. So just a few reminders, um, the HSR Act size of transaction threshold is now at 111.4 million. Of course, that's assuming that the size of person criteria test is met. This is the most common route to HSR review. Um, and I know Foley sent around a blast, um, but please have on your radar that in 2023, uh, the FTC and DOJ proposed sweeping changes to the HSR Act antitrust review form um, that's going to create significant burdens to antitrust review. I know there's been significant pushback, um, so we are certain to keep our eye on where that ultimately shakes out. Um, something for you to keep your eye on as well. Um, and then as you are looking at deals and the way that the FTC and DOJ may evaluate them, um, there has been an increasing focus on labor effects of mergers in their reviews. Um, and they've also been you know, reviewing the quote unquote big mergers uh, with increasing skepticism you know, regardless of market effects, um, even in the case of private equity owners with seemingly no market overlap. Um, so they have been very aggressive in their review. Um, HSR, fact, or HSR Act fees um, were also increased this year for the first time in 20 years. So again, I guess the story is despite the challenging economic environment, uh, there are more hurdles for buyers and sellers to get deals done, you know, in terms of time, cost and complexity as the government takes a closer look at these transactions. And then finally, uh, the other, the last thing to keep your eye on, um, personal favorite topic of mine, because uh, who doesn't love a long period in between signing and closing as you await government approvals is CFIUS. Um, the Biden administration has continued to apply CFIUS in a very rigorous fashion to cross-border deals, um, giving very broad interpretation to the concept of quote unquote national security I'm repeatedly amazed at what constitutes national security. Um, and they've even been seeking out uh, reviews of non-notified transactions. And so those transactions where the parties have determined to not notify CFIUS of a potential inbound acquisition and um, you know, CFIUS taking note um, that they should have done that. Um, so uh, you know, ultimately, uh, if you are involved in a cross-border M&A deal in the middle market space, uh, and it is involving a foreign buyer, you know, please do plan ahead for CFIUS review, because as with most matters, um, you know, planning ahead can save uh, time on the back end. Uh, now, Craig will uh, speak about the latest in the uh, rep and warranty space and middle market. All right. So the final sort of trend that we want to talk about here today in our, our presentation, it's sort of uh, important enough that it bears uh, kind of covering on its own slide uh, is, you know, some of the trends that we're seeing with rep and warranty insurance. Uh, no doubt many of you are familiar with the product, but for those who are not, uh, just very briefly, this is a specialty insurance product that buyers in an M&A transaction can purchase to insure themselves against the, uh, the, the risk that the sellers will breach their representation warranties and uh, potentially create certain other liabilities associated with the acquisition it came into existence, I would say roughly about 10 years ago, um, and has really steadily taken over the market uh, to the point where now, as the slide says in 2023, this has essentially become standard for, for transactions of almost any size, about any except for sort of the very smallest transactions, uh, or perhaps those where the buyer um, for whatever reason, you know, has, has a slight aversion to purchasing the product. Um, we see this occasionally with European buyers where the product is a little bit less familiar with them uh, coming into the market in the US. Uh, they may be slightly less likely to, uh, to to make use of rep and warranty insurance, although even that uh, I think more recently has been has been changing. Um, but, uh, 
you know, as I said, no doubt many of you are familiar with rep and warranty insurance, have seen it on transactions that you've been involved in. Um, and uh, for those of you who were involved in M&A in 2020 and 2021, you probably recall that it, uh, at the time, you know, the, the balance of power, so to speak, with respect to rep and warranty insurance had tilted very heavily in favor of the insurers. It was very difficult to get insurers to place policies when they were placed. Uh, they were coming at, you know, very, very high terms, uh, very pricey terms. Um, and in large part, that's because, you know, along with the, the surge in demand, uh, the surge in, in M&A activity during that period came a surge in demand for uh, rep and warranty insurance policies. Well, the flip side of that trend is that now that we've sort of come off the peak of uh, M&A activity uh, down from 21 uh, through 22 to 23, uh, the demand for rep and warranty insurance policies has likewise uh, seen a drop off as well. And so that means that, you know, premiums and terms are currently very advantageous to parties engaged uh, in an M&A transaction. They've improved uh, considerably over that sort of drop off in M&A activity as the carriers now have more capacity and are looking to place uh, more policies. Um, so what we're seeing right now is that premiums are typically averaging about 2.3 to 2.6% of policy limits. And, you know, a standard approach for most transactions is to place a policy that has with a policy limit of about 10% of the purchase price. So for example, for a $300 million transaction, you might purchase a $30 million policy, which would then, uh, have a premium about 2.3 to 2.6 uh, percent of that amount. Um, policy limits typically bottom out, I would say around $3 million in coverage. So, you know, once you start to get under about $30 million in purchase price, um, the carriers either won't place a policy less than about $3 million or, or you'll find that uh, the pricing terms, you know, for policies below that amount don't offer much uh, in the way of savings as compared to, say, a $3 million policy. Um, remember that in addition to those premiums, there are typically also about thirty-five to forty-five thousand dollars of non-refundable underwriting fees. So that's an additional cost that uh, gets factored into the equation. Uh, and as we'll talk about shortly, you know, will get allocated between the parties. Once you've got a policy, we're looking currently at initial retentions of about half a percent to three quarters of a percent of the purchase price. That's down. Uh, considerably from a few years ago where it was typically starting at about 1% of the purchase price. Um, and then after the retention drops down, which typically happens about 12 to 18 months after the closing, uh, depending on the terms of the transaction, we're looking at a drop down to about 0.3 to 0.5%, um, subject to certain sort of minimum retention amounts that the carriers will enforce. Uh, in some cases, you may even see that drop, that retention drop down to 0% or maybe a quarter of a percent for things like uh, true fundamentals where, you know, the risk, the insurers don't see a whole lot of risk, you know, after the, sort of that initial period. They, they figure for those most fundamental reps, you know, if there's a breach, it's going to surface right away. And if it hasn't surfaced within, you know, the first 12 to 18 months, they're willing to drop that retention uh, down to zero or near zero. Um, if you're looking at a deal uh, where there's no seller indemnity, you'll probably add about 10 to 15 basis points uh, to the premiums. Um, we're definitely seeing insurers making fewer sort of deemed changes to the reps and warranties and other provisions of the purchase agreement. Uh, in the past, when insurers could be afford to be a little bit more selective, uh, they would often read changes into the purchase agreement. And so even though the parties had sort of fully negotiated the reps and warranties they wanted, uh, the insurers wouldn't necessarily accept those at face values. They'd say that there are changes that would be deemed to be made to those uh, as far as what the policy would cover. We're seeing a lot less of that now. Um, policies are still typically being issued with a three-year term for non-fundamental reps and warranties and a six-year term for fundamental reps and uh, other matters like uh, uh, the tax indemnity. Um, and we're seeing we're seeing policies being placed for transactions as small as uh, 15 million dollars, and in some cases, you know, occasionally even lower. I think we've seen them down to about five million dollars, um, very rarely, but still, um, you know, and that's down considerably. Where um, I think even a few years ago, people wouldn't consider placing a policy for anything less than, say, a 30 million dollar transaction. Um, so we're definitely seeing it become available to to a wider slice of the market. Uh, buyers and sellers still negotiate over a wide range of terms. 
um, who pays for what, you know, who bears the cost of the premiums, the underwriting costs, the overall cost to obtain the policy, who bears the cost of the retention, uh, if that comes into effect, and for which types of claims. Parties are increasingly getting very creative as, so, as far as um, which types of claims they will allocate the expenses for. It's no longer just sort of a one size fits all uh, model as far as allocating the uh, the policy costs and the retention costs. Um, we're also seeing, you know, obviously the insurers may exclude certain matters from coverage, although as I said before, we're seeing uh, less of that as insurers can afford to be sort of less selective in the, in the policies that they place. Um, but similarly, the parties may negotiate sort of what is subject to rep and warranty coverage only um, and what you know, the parties may still have, what the seller may still have a direct indemnification obligation uh, even after the policy has provided coverage or in case the policy doesn't provide coverage. Um, and then finally, I think we're seeing that, you know, walk away, especially in, in sort of the larger middle market, I think we're seeing that walk away transactions are becoming increasingly common where the sellers have almost no liability after the closing. Um, and just anecdotally, I don't have any statistics on this, but I think the other thing we've seen here is that especially with private equity buyers in walkaway transactions, um, we're seeing some private equity buyers who have started to choose to sort of, you know, self-insure rather than, uh, you know, the parties may negotiate that the buyer's only recourse will be a rep and warranty policy. But in some cases, we're seeing the buyers then sort of further negotiate to say, you know, well, that may be the case you know, the buyer doesn't necessarily have to acquire a rep and warranty insurance policy. They may decide to take that risk on themselves. I think that's still a minority position, but definitely something that we've seen more recently that, you know, wasn't there a few years ago. Um, finally, then just a few notes uh, as we, you know, sort of think about placing the policy. Um, we still think there's probably a minimum of about 10 to 15 days uh, to get a rep and warranty policy in place. Um, and so sometimes, you know, it helps to factor that in, especially if it's a very fast moving transaction. I think the, you know, sort of the traditional more sort of relaxed pace of placing a policy would be about 21 to 30 days overall. Uh, but certainly we've seen that insurers are more willing to work with buyers and sort of expedite their process. Um, kind of the reverse trend here of, of some of the lending activity that we've seen where lenders have become you know, much more diligent and applied much more scrutiny to their lending practices. I think we've seen the rep and warranty insurers here much more willing to sort of move the transactions through the placement and underwriting uh, process. Um, still though, probably a minimum of 10 to 15 days required to do this. Um, and then finally, the number of, you know, claims that we've seen uh, as far as rep and warranty policies go. I think more recently we've seen claims on the rise and partly that's due to just the sheer volume of policies that were placed in, you know, 2021, early 2022, you know, as those deals now play out and they start to reach the end of their uh, indemnity periods, the end of their coverage periods, we're seeing the claims start to get filed on those. And so it's sort of a lag off of that uh, peak. Um, you know, sort of what we've seen or what we've heard from the insurers is that, you know, most claims, um, probably about 20% of policies end up having claims. And those that do have claims, you know, you typically see about 80% of them uh, within 24 months of the closing. So again, that 21 to 22 window, early 22 window of, of the real peak of the M&A activity, you know, we're kind of getting up on the 24 month um, marker out from those dates. And so, um, you know, that's where we're, that's where we're kind of seeing that, that rise in claims. Um, the most common breaches I think that we have seen sort of in the in the uh, rep and warranty claims are things like breaches of financial statement reps, uh, compliance with laws reps, uh, employee benefits reps, IT and data security, and then uh, material contracts. Um, and I think our advice, uh, you know, for anyone who's working in this space is that even though sometimes these rep and warranty claims can take a long time, seemingly long time to resolve, as it says there on the slide, you know, probably about one year is what you should allow. Um, I think there's a couple of things that you can do to sort of ease that burden uh, with your own clients or as you directly work with, with insurers. And that's, you know, number one is sort of setting those expectations. Um, you know, while I think everyone thinks that rep and warranty insurance is a valuable product, it's not gonna be something that moves very quickly. Um, and so setting those expectations up front can sort of reduce some of the tension. The other thing I think we'd suggest is sort of, 
you know, treating the relationship with the insurer as sort of a cooperative relationship. Um, I think we've seen it go badly when the relationship gets antagonistic. Um, and a lot of times this is because the insurer is sort of operating in the dark. They're not nearly as familiar with the transaction um, as the parties who are directly involved or their counsel might be. And so, you know, helping the insurer overcome some of that information asymmetry, treating it as a cooperative relationship, I think we've seen that, you know, work a lot better as far as uh, getting the claims to pay out and, and getting the funds in the hands of, of the policyholders. So, um, I think that's all we've got as far as M&A trends, uh, both for rep and warranty insurance and for the presentation as a whole. Um, we've got a little bit of time here left for questions. Um, and again, if you've got any questions, feel free to enter them in the uh, Q&A feature in your interface. Uh, but if uh, failing any questions, um, I think that's all we've got for today. So thanks again, everybody, for uh, joining. I think you should have our contact information. So if you think of any questions after the fact, feel free to reach out uh, with your questions separately. Thank you.